Thanks, uh, thanks, Lionel. Thanks to um, Kyle and, and Lee for uh, inviting me. Um, great course. So we're going to talk about uh, navigation, and uh, I'll do a brief overview of navigation, the applications of it anteriorly and posteriorly, and then uh, some tips and tricks that I've learned over the years. Um, and navigation really kind of fits into this uh, overarching um, computer-assisted surgery paradigm. And really what we're trying to do is improve the accuracy of surgical technique. And uh, we can kind of break it out into you know, ease of uh, the surgery for the surgeon and obviously benefit uh, to the patient. And ultimately, we want to improve the outcomes and quality of care and decrease the cost of care. And I think navigation does, uh, is a tool that, that allows us to do that. But it's amazing how this is uh, still very low-hanging fruit, and um, there's still a, a huge segment of the, um, uh, of the sector that doesn't actually uh, embrace this. Um, and you know, one of the things that I've um, learned um, about navigation is that it, you know, it's a tool. It's not just a machine to turn it on and it does uh, something for you. It's a tool. And like any tool, whether it's a lanky probe or a screw, you have to learn how to use that tool and you have to know how that tool um, responds in your hands. And the number one thing that I like about navigation is that it's predictable. So none of the papers really tell us um, you know, they, we talk about accuracy of pedicle screw placement, for example, but there isn't any paper that says how long or how many times that it, um, that it took you to get that screw into the pedicle. So was it once, twice, three times. Uh, whereas with navigation, I think you can hit the, the, the pedicle um, predictably uh, on the first shot. And navigation really uh, is about obtaining registration and maintaining registration. And if you can obtain and maintain registration, that's kind of the, that, that encapsulates the, uh, the, 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 the uh, technique. So um, again, the predictability, nobody likes to get punched in the face and we've all been there and it's a bad day in the operating room when we get punched in the face. Um, and I think navigation can prevent us uh, from, from getting punched in the face. So why do I use navigation apart from the predictability? Well, if the anatomy is challenging, then for me, it becomes very efficient, it's accurate, and again, it's predictable. Uh, we heard earlier about how it's important to have improved pedicle fill. And so at the time, you can look at the pedicle because you have that cross-sectional uh, imaging and you can say how big should the screw be. Uh, we can improve our construct, so we can, um, you know, uh, easily do four rod constructs, SAI screws, um, things like that. For uh, minimally invasive surgery, guide wireless perk screws um, are very easy to do. So you drop a, a projection; you actually don't need um, a guide wire. It makes the procedure safer. For the surgeon, we avoid radiation, and I'm going to talk a little bit about osteotomy planning and precision medicine. Um, and custom uh, implants. And then this is kind of off-label, but you can actually uh, MR merge um, the CT scan onto an MRI and actually navigate off of an MRI intraoperatively. So in my hands, if I just tried to freehand this, it would be a very long day. But if you learn how to use navigation, this uh, case becomes as simple as a, as a degenerative case because you can um, identify the bony landmarks and you can um, appropriately place the screws and have good pedicle screws. So the point here is that you don't start with this case, you start with an easy case and when you learn how to use the easy cases, this case becomes actually easy. And if you think, well, you know, I don't use image guidance. Um, I think I would push back a little bit and say it's we're really kind of in an evolution whether you use an x-ray to make sure your your uh, screws are fine or whether you use fluoroscopy to make sure your screws are fine it's all image guidance and it's time to evolve so what is what is sort of the 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 essence of, of navigation and it's really about as I said obtaining and maintaining registration and when this first registration first came out it was about putting a, a, a frame onto somebody's anatomy, bolting it to their head and registering, and, and then you could navigate off that frame. Um, and, but we've actually you know, evolved in a frameless registration. And you have to think about aligning three different spaces, the physical space, the image space, and the tracker space. And that alignment is what registration is. And there's a transformation, mathematical transformation that occurs in these systems that allows us to align these, uh, these coordinates. So you have the image coordinates, um, you have the physical space coordinates, and that could be uh, whether you're talking about a robotic arm or whether you're talking about uh, uh, sort of a, an optic system, it's the same thing. And then you have 
either a markerless uh, registration thing, which is uh, like surface registration, or whether you're gonna mount a tracker to the patient, and uh, that's a marker-based parapoint registration. And then, as I said, there's this other class, which is image-to-image -image registration, which I'll, I'll touch on briefly. So how does it work intraoperatively? Um, there's the, uh, the, 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 the camera system that looks at uh, fiducials on the, uh, on the image system. It also looks at the tracker. And so we now have the image uh, space and we have the patient space. And then there's a transformation and there's a rotational and a linear translation that's in this transformation uh, algorithm. But inherent in any system, no, no system's perfect. So there's gonna be uh, localization errors. So in other words, the optics are never gonna be perfect, right? We can't invent a, a system that's perfect. So there's gonna be some error there. There's gonna be some registration error. In other words, when you do a scan and the, and the scan kind of moves up and down, there's gonna be some scan distortion. So you're gonna get an error there. And then when you're moving the tracker around in space, there's gonna be a little bit of error there. That's inherent in any system. And you have to know what that error is in the system. And essentially it's small. It's you know, between a half a millimeter and two millimeters, depending on the system. But you have to know that there's gonna be some error. But where the errors come in, is it's us, it's the surgeons, it's the people who are using the tool that don't know how to use the tool, and there's eight common errors that we make. Uh, patient positioning, but the, the, the two big ones, um, which kind of lead to these bigger errors, are really line of sight, so where you put the reference frame, and reference frame stability. So if you kind of put it in and don't sync it very well and it's in osteoporotic bone and the frame moves, you're gonna bump the frame, the frame's gonna go off, the registration process goes off, and then guess who gets blamed? Not the surgeon, the system gets blamed, but it's actually the surgeon. So I think we have to own the fact that when we're using navigation, we actually have to understand these common extrinsic errors or the surgeon errors uh, when we're doing it. Um, so what about surgical and imaging workflow? Well, there's all kinds of different tools, and based on the tools that you're using, it kind of changes your workflow a little bit. Um, there's, you know, drill guides, drills, taps, osteotomes, um, disc prep sets, which are great, and then um, cage, you know, cages. But one of the big things when you're using a system, and this is something that's not talked about a lot, either with robotics or navigation, is the burden of technology in the operating room. And when we bring in these big, sort of sophisticated uh, systems and equipment, we can't run it all. Like you can't be like concentrating on the surgery and trying to run that system. So you have to you have to have a co-pilot. You have to build a team. That team has to be there all the time, and you have to get good at it. And when you build a team, then it's it's smooth sailing. So here's some examples of why you know it's like it's hard to it's hard to prove this, but just looking at it, you can see that cross-sectional image it allows you to put that uh, pedicle screw in the first time, ideally. Uh, every time. And, um, you know, doing SAI screws makes SAI screws dead easy. This is kind of dropping a projection down so you can kind of follow, um, you know, the, the pathway. Uh, Dr. Theologis and I uh, published on cervical uh, um, uh, pedicle screws. And as these tools become more refined, the accuracy uh, in this, uh, um, in the navigation uh, realm becomes more and more accurate. So we published on um, subaxial cervical pedicle screws uh, a few years ago um, and uh, had a very high, um, high uh, accuracy and success rate. But you don't just necessarily have to use uh, navigation for putting in screws. You can use it to uh, look around at the anatomy and say, oh, is that frame and tight? Um, can it use a little bit more uh, decompression? You can put in cages. It's an example of a plif cage, a bilateral plif cage. And then uh, Dean Chow and I kind of published on our um, anterior experience um, using a, a anterior to the psoas technique and had 95% accuracy rate of placing screws. Now again, when you're dealing with this simple degenerative uh, spine, uh, it, it's easy to do. But once you start to have really rotational deformity and you're trying to fit that cage in direct lateral in something that's rotated 30 or 40 degrees, navigation becomes pretty sweet. But it becomes, it's as easy as doing it um, in, a, in a straight spine um, if you learn how to use the technique. 
this is kind of the uh, the surface uh, uh, merge the MR um, uh, uh, MR to CT merge that we can do again off label. But uh, we have the ORM scan, we have the MRI scan, and Jason Stroh, who's in the back of the room there, uh, you know, kind of taught me how to do this. And we you kind of match the um, uh, match the bony anatomy to the uh, the MRI anatomy, and then now you can actually navigate a tumor. And I've used this technique finding some very, very difficult tumors buried kind of under iliac uh, vessels and things like that. And it's been a real game changer. So again, it's, it's allowed me to uh, not get punched in the face um, during certain procedures. Well, what about MIS? Again, um, straightforward. This is, the, this is kind of the, uh, the picture that we all want. We want a uh, cross-sectional image. We know where everything is, depth and um, alignment. Again, dropping a projection and um, being able to, uh, to reproduce that. So I'm going to talk a little bit about osteotomies, and this is kind of, uh, you know, getting into, you know, we go from theoretical, we have all this machine, machine learning and predictive analytics now, and we have a theory about how our osteotomy should go, but at the, on the other hand, we have to actually get our technique to be precise, and again, I think this is where navigation can really um, can help. So uh, Dr. Metz and I published this paper back in 2008, where we actually did a, um, a complex uh, case, used uh, the MIMIC software uh, for materialize and um, osteotomize this, this, this patient and prove that we could use navigation to, um, to plan out complex um, uh, procedures. Um, this, we published this as a case report in, in, in Spine. But here's an example of, I think, um, more of a routine use in a pedicle subtraction osteotomy. And again, we have these, uh, these, uh, these algorithms now that are becoming more and more robust that kind of predict what we need to do for a patient, whether that's uh, a, a distribution between four to one or trying to prevent uh, proximal junctional kyphosis through reciprocal kyphosis. We get these plans. And now if we have this like sophisticated plan, we should have a technique that allows us to accurately reproduce that plan uh, in, the, in, the, um, uh, in the operating room. So here's a patient who's got um, some, some uh, sagittal malalignment. I wanted to do a pedicle uh, subtraction osteotomy. And I used the stealth navigation system to drop the wedge that I had pre-calculated onto the, the uh, patient's anatomy at the time of surgery, and that allows me to determine exactly where my cuts are going to be. So in that case, I, I, or in this case, I had predicted um, uh, that we needed 20 degrees of um, correction. I dropped the 20 degree wedge, and now all I have to do is use a tool to cut that 20 degrees out of the, out of the spine. And you know things work in, in parallel. So this is the Mysonics, and now we have a tool that allows me to cut the spine very, very accurately. And the image on the, on the left there just shows that I haven't actually cut all the bone away to get to that 20 degree wedge, and I still have some more work to do. And then a pedicle subtraction osteotomy becomes like cut by numbers. We just know where the cuts are. That's the wedge kind of looking from a, a dorsal to ventral view, and I, I know where it's gonna be. Um, we can harvest a lot of bone with that, uh, you know, with the Mysonics and, and removing the, the wedge and reproducibly um, get that 20 degree correction. So I think this is just an example of how we can use navigation, not only just for putting in screws, but also for our osteotomies. And uh, hopefully that will translate into uh, improved, um, uh, improved outcomes. There are limitations to navigation. Uh, I've talked about the intrinsic errors, the extrinsic errors, which are the things that we all need to think about every time we use it. Segmental motion, where if the spine moves when we're, when we're uh, actually navigating, it requires an additional scan, and that's a technological thing that needs to be solved or improved upon as time goes on. And then when you're, when you're embracing navigation, there are workflow changes. And again, you need a co-pilot in the operating room and a team that, to, that knows how to run this stuff. You can't just do it all on your, uh, on your own. So again, build a consistent team. Um, I think, in, at least in my hands, um, I've enjoyed uh, the reduction in radiation and the improved accuracy and predictability, both using navigation anterior and posteriorly. Um, and again, it's a tool, and I think this is a tool that will augment the skills of any surgeon, but you have to learn how to use it. Thanks.